So I, I work at the Health and Safety Laboratory. My background is um, I'm a psychologist. I've, well, I have a lot of education um, and an um, ergonomist. But I, I did a PhD in safety culture. And um, what's interesting is that when I did my PhD, safety culture was, was fashionable. So I wasn't the only one doing a PhD in the early 1990s in safety culture. And uh, I've been working in you know, doing work on safety culture for about the last 20 years. And it's one of those things that it has, you know, it has its moments of being back in fashion. And it seems to be back in fashion. Okay, so this is, um, this is how we think about aspiring to organisational reliability. And we sort of think of it as, you know, four steps. So where you actually want to be is here, jumping up and down, and everything's good. But where the sort of safety climate tool fits in is, you know, where are your people at? Explore the attitudes and behaviours of your people. So, you, you know, so you might have some stuff when you're starting off about understanding your systems, um, you know, do, do you have, do you have risk controls, perhaps safety management systems, do you have, you know, do you have those things in place? And then you want to understand, you know, where your people are, are they engaged in that, are they following the procedures, are they doing what you want to do? And then using that as your baseline, you can think, okay, what can we do to change? How can we make this, make it happen? Whatever it may be. Okay, so what is safety culture? One definition, mean, there's lots and lots of definitions of safety culture. But what is a culture that allows the boss to hear bad news? Do people actually communicate bad news upwards? Or is it everything sugar-coated and it's all fine? So understanding where your organisation is with regards to that is, you know, is central to what your safety culture is. Okay, so some more pictures of what safety culture could be. We have a man with his head in the sand. And we have a lady sweeping things under the carpet. Again, these are all you know, metaphors for what is done with the information in your organisation. You know, are you a manager who prefer, prefers to have his head in the sand rather than hearing about things? Or are you an employee who yeah, prefers to sweep it under the carpet? So again, there's lots of formal and informal definitions of safety culture. The safety climate tool which, um, which we developed at the laboratory is an attitude survey. So it's what sits, sits up here and it asks questions about your perceptions on health and safety, on trust, uh, on organisational commitment. And the thing that, you know, if you're interested in safety culture, people will say to you, it's only attitudes, it's an attitude survey. It's like, it is an attitude survey, but the attitudes that people have will actually influence how they behave. And if your, if your systems, if they think that your systems are poor, that the PPE is uncomfortable, that the procedures are unworkable, then it's unlikely, so that, you know, so that the perceptions of those issues, it's unlikely that they will actually do what you want them to do when you want them to do it. They might do it when you're standing over them, but they're probably less likely to do it, you know, in the middle of the night or at the weekend, um, you know, which may be when your accidents are happening. Safety cultures, how, how we make sense of the world with regards to safe, safety, and the safety climate tool is your perceptions of that. Okay, so Matt, why might you pick up the safety climate tool? You know, why might you think, okay, we, we need to measure this? It might be that your safety measures have plateaued, so your performance, you don't look like you're getting better anymore. You know, what, you know why, why have things stagnated? It might be just that, you know, you want more information. So, um, you know, if you work for an organisation that likes key performance indicators, you could use it as a KPI just to show that things are going in the right direction. It's just another measure. So if you're in um, an industry that doesn't have large numbers of near misses and incidents and um, accidents, then getting a measurement of safety culture 
gives you something else to see, you know, are you, are you going in the right direction. Other people have used it to help them make the decision about whether or not behaviour change. It can be used to help you understand, is behaviour change what we should be doing? Is behaviour change the right thing for your organisation? So it might be, if you use the safety climate tool, you might have some quick wins on accidents and near misses, rather than spending a lot of money using some proprietal um, behaviour change system. It could be you can do things immediately rather than embarking on some program. You can also use it to understand different organisational groups. Um, so if you, uh, you know, if you have a multi-site organisation or you have a, a large organisation with lots of different departments, it might be important to understand, you know, what the relative strengths and weaknesses of those are. Um, so that you can share best practice or find out you know, what it is that they're doing that engages their staff versus um, you know, somebody else. And finally, <laughs> um, and probably it shouldn't be finally, it demonstrates commitment. So by picking up the safety climate tool, you're making a statement to say that safety is important, your opinions are important, we're going to listen to them, and we're going to act on those. Because as, you know, as, if you use the safety climate tool and you don't listen to what people have said, you don't you know, develop action plans or do anything with it, you will probably be in a worse place than you were before you picked up the safety climate tool. Because by not listening to your employees, by, you know, by engaging in the process and not doing anything with it, is, yeah, it's not a good idea. Okay, so what is the safety climate tool? It was, it's based on a tool that was sold by the Health and Safety Executive in the 1990s. It, um, it was sold for just over 10 years um, and over 800 copies of it was sold. It was 72 questions long, so it was much, much, much longer. We went embarked on a revision process. We had a lot of data that had been submitted for benchmarking, which meant that, okay, you know, from a statistical point of view, we've got, we can look at the question to make sure that the, the tool still works, that it's valid. We've done a lot of work for um, health and safety executive, looking at what safety culture was, you know, what best practice was. Was it covering the, the issues that should be in there? So that, you know, that, was leadership in there? Was trust in there? Were, were things that were, um, you know, emerging, emerging as themes? Were they still in the question set? And, and the final thing that made it much easier for me to revise the safety climate tool, sadly, was that the BP plant in Texas City exploded, and suddenly um, safety culture was fashionable again. What we wanted to do was create a tool that could discriminate between good and bad. So if everybody was answering, um, I strongly agree, then to a question, for example, um, I've had sufficient training to do my job safely. And what we found from the 50,000 quest questions was that um, eight out of 10 people, you know, it's a bit like the whiskers out there, eight out of 10 people were saying they knew how to do their job safely. And if I asked all of you, do you know how to do your job safely? On the whole, you put your hand up. So it's not actually helping you understand what a good culture is versus what a bad culture is. Because you have questions that don't, you know, don't allow you to discriminate between the good performers and the poor performers, which was, you know, which was important to us. And we also got rid of, there were questions on morale, you know, do you, in, do you enjoy your job or... Um, and with the best will in the world, I don't think any safety manager can actually change those attitudes. So it's okay. Again, it needed to be something that people could make changes based on the information. So we ended up with 40 questions, uh, 37 of which came from the, uh, the original tool. So it's, it's still very much a legacy product. It has the whole you know, all of the research and the, um, 
concrete science behind the wording of those questions and you know and, and they were um, it's made up of eight factors so again it's a, it's a little bit like a, a bingo we've got organizational commitment and leadership um, risk-taking behaviors though obviously it says health and safety oriented behaviors to be more positive um, we have trust procedures engagement peer group resources for health and safety and then there's things about accident and damage reporting do you find out what's going on okay so obviously this slide is now out of date um because the, the world changes in the, the weeks since i submitted them to michelle and um, it was launched in its current format in january uh, 2010 we have benchmark data so companies um have given their data to us so from, from the users who've used the tool in the last um, last three years we have we have more than that obviously now we have about 45,000 uh, survey returns from about eight companies which means that we have quite a good understanding of how people are performing and um, the biggest sector we uh, sell into or sold it to is process and manufacturing um, construction and engineering the safety climate tool was mandated across the construction of the olympic park the olympic park had a health and safety legacy so they had legacies for everything you know they, they wanted basically to show that there was a legacy for the country from spending all that money and doing the olympics so um, and one el element of the health and safety health and safety legacy was safety culture and that they had to demonstrate that they had a good safety culture and you know in line with good safety performance so to measure their safety culture goal um, they use the safety climate tool on a, a modified version of the safety climate tool um, and it was mandated across the entire build so it was um, all of the tier one contractors had to use it as did all their supply chain and they gave us all their data which was really good Again, i don't get out much <laughs> um, and what, what we found when we looked at the data how do this the um, what we found when we looked at the data was that the companies in the olympic park were performing better than all the other people in our data set which di you know didn't make sense to us um, as as white collar workers it's like well how you know how can the olympic park build you know construction building these things be safer than i don't know hsl that doesn't make sense to me how can they have a better culture than hsl so what you're looking at here is the, the eight factors that, that you saw on the earlier diagram, the eight factors of the safety climate tool. Um, so the closer you are to five, the better your culture is in terms of the factor scores, um, and one is the lowest. This is the, the outside line is the best company on the Olympic Park. The, the next one in, the magenta one, is the mean score on the Olympic Park. And then you get two lines that are very close together. The green line is slightly above the lowest score on the Olympic Park. And before that, that was the highest score. So that was the best company in my all industry data set. What is it that they're doing? What, you know, what is their secret? Because, going back to my, uh, my early slide, it's like, their construction, they, ca you know, they can't actually be that good. It's a peripatetic workforce, you know, the, a lot, a lot of constant change, people coming and going, different skills, different trades coming in. It's traditionally high risk. Historically, it's considered to be poor. And it has acknowledged issues with leadership and engagement, just because of the way they are. And the Safety Climate Tool was suggesting the opposite. Um, and I'm a cynic. It's like, well, maybe you know, maybe those twenty-two thousand surveys they submitted were all fraudulent. You know, maybe somebody was sitting there just ticking the boxes. And then I thought, no, that's just 
It's a step too far from anybody there, isn't it? 22,000 surveys, maybe not. But we were fortunate enough also, we carried out some work for the ODA and for health and safety research work, which went, um, we ran focus groups um, and interviews with um, seven of the venues and with the senior leadership in the ODA and within the um, CLM, who were the client organisation. And what we found was that they were amazing. They were doing all of the things that you would hope, you know, a good company would do. Um, you know, we went, you know, when we're running focus groups, you know, people, it was perceived as fair. So qualitatively, they were very good. Their leadership was e excellent. They put a lot of effort into engaging with their workforce and demonstrating the commitment to, um, to health and safety. And all of that was also reflected in the safety outcomes. You know, they, they had, it, you know, it was the first Olympic stadium that didn't kill anybody. It was the first, you know, and the entire construction process didn't kill anybody either. So it wasn't just, you know, the stadium. I think, I think maybe Beijing killed eight people in the construction of the stadium without, you know, without taking into account all of the people that died in the other you know, the rest of the construction. So what I'm saying is that the safety climate tool was excellent and their outcome measures were not so excellent. So maybe there's a link. What we'd originally intended with the research was to go into Team Stadium and say, this is what Team Stadium did on um, organisational commitment. This is what the Aquatic Centre did on the emission reporting. With the idea of, you know, branding up these case studies that were you know, just linked to one organisation and you know, one, one theme of excellence. But when we, when, what we found when we went in and did the work was that all of them were doing variations on the same thing. They all had behavioural safety schemes, for example. They all had um, reward and recognition schemes. Everybody was pleased with, uh, you know, with the things that showed that they were working for, uh, for the Olympics. So they all had elements of the same thing. They had safety, health and environment leadership teams, which all of the project leaders sat in on, which meant that they were all competing with each other because none of them wanted to be the person that turned up at the table and said, we've had an accident, we've killed somebody. It's the only place I think as well that I've been where there was a perception of fairness. So usually when I, go in and we talk to people in organisations and run focus groups, people always can identify, you know, some guy that's been disciplined, uh, some, you know, some scaffolder that's been, you know, is no longer allowed on site. So, you know, they, they, there's always these examples of one-on-one -on -one situations where, you know, somebody has been disciplined and gone out. What they did at the Olympic Park was that they made their expectations clear and everybody was treated in exactly the same way. So instead of it's you know, it's okay, he's a manager, he doesn't need to wear safety boots. You know, the, the managers would get treated in exactly the same way as the employees. Which meant that you didn't get all of that chuntering and moaning about things not being fair because everybody was treated the same way. Okay, so this is sort of rounding up some of the some of our thoughts on the what what we saw in the Olympic Park. The leadership, the worker engagement, and the commitment was embedded. You know, everybody believed what they heard. There was also a lot, you know, of the striving for excellence, the going for gold. You know. The UK, UK being on the world stage, that you know, the, the Olympics was this opportunity for London and for construction to shine, and I think they, they all rose to that challenge. There was also because it was such a long duration project, you know, compared to a lot of construction, they could try things, and if it didn't work, they would change it. So that's what I mean by sort of you know, it's dynamic and long term. So there were some things that they you know they decided they would do. 
and if it turned out it wasn't working, instead of just sticking with something that wasn't working, they'd change it. You know, very much sort of, le you know, learning from experience and through, you know, through these very senior level um, interaction, you know, they could just make decisions. There was also consistency through the supply chain. So it was clear from the outset with the, you know, the, the supply chain, safety was built into those contracts and it was clear to all of them that, that this was the way we did it. What was interesting was that what was found on the Olympic Park is all good practice. You know, there's, there's no real surprises from, you know, from what I've told you. It's just not that common to see it all being done and see it all being done so well, um, which I think is, you know, it shows that it is possible. Okay, so this is what Lawrence Waterman said, who is head of health and safety at the ODA. Basically, what he was saying was that, you know, you, you can use the survey without having to have the accidents. You know, they, it gives you information about what you're doing and how, you're, you, know, how you are. So one of the key, key things about safety culture is, can you stop work? Um, you know, one of our questions is around productivity and health and safety. And we find when we go to speak to people that this, you know, it's quite an important thing. Do people actually think if they see something unsafe that they can stop work? So in the Deepwater Horizon um, accident, BP, Transocean, Halliburton, they all had stop work policies. So if, you know, each of those organisations had stop work policies. Did any of them use it? I think the, uh, yeah. the scale of the, uh, the disaster would suggest not. We always get interesting results when we, you know, when we look at the data from this question. So senior managers say work can be stopped, and employees tend to be less less emphatic about that. So this is a, a company that we did some work with, and their data. So the question is, productivity is usually seen as more important than health and safety. If you're hourly paid. Uh, 70% 70, 70 of them thought that productivity came first um, versus 0% of management. And they were all in the same company. And what we typically find is that your supervisors are somewhere in the middle, which again is probably not much of a surprise to you. Okay, so I have a few, um, a few slides that are just examples of what some of the outputs from the safety climate tool look like. Um, so green is always good, uh, red is always bad, and yellow is somewhere in between maybe. This diagram allows you to see the differences by where you are in the organisation. So typically management are much more optimistic than employees, and if they're not much more much optimistic than employees, it's worth finding out why. So I've recently done some work with organisations on where management have been pessimistic on risk-taking behaviours or health and safety oriented behaviours and exploring why that was was quite interesting. Basically the management, because they see all their accident statistics, they assume that obviously their employees are you know, violating procedures, not doing what they want to do and taking risks at work. Whereas the workforce perceptions weren't, yeah, were that they weren't like that. So again, the, the safety climate tool allows you to, to explore the differences within your organisation. So this is a factor chart. So it's the accident and the image reporting chart. Um, so you have on the, the top line um, is the, the summary of the results. And then below that you have the, the question scores. So it allows you to interrogate, interrogate the data and look, look at where your issues might be. So on this factor, um, you know, near this near are always reported. Um, you've got 23% who are positive on this and 78% uh, that are, are not positive on it. So it's okay. We have things that we can do here, things to improve. And if you find out why people are saying what they, they are, so on accident and near reporting, then it, it helps guide how you can improve. Okay, so this is a, a little uh, safety climate tool cycle. Um, basically, if you were, if you're going to use safety climate tool, you'd have 
you'd have some preparation steps. So you'd think about what you know, who you were going to survey. Were you going to use paper? Were you going to use the, maybe the online survey? Are you going to put posters up? Are you going to you know brief your employees? So you'd have you know you'd have some things about basically getting the groundwork right. You might run it. Um, you know, so you might send the links out, or you might organise you know get all your employees in your canteen and get them to fill it in their papers. So you'd have some you know some some bit where you actually run the survey, you then use the software to analyse it, um, have a look at the charts, and look at the auto reports and say, okay, you know, what what do, what does it tell us? You might say, okay, you know, it looks like um, some bits of the organisation has um, has issues, and, you know, maybe we should run some focus groups, um, discussions with employees to find out, okay, why are they saying that and how can we improve? Use that then to guide the action plans. You know, okay, we, people have said um, you know, near misses are not reported, and they're not reported because you know, they're not anonymous. And it's okay, you know, maybe we can just put a box on box on the street, and then you might just start on it again. So you put in place an action plan and spend you know, I don't know, 18 months and um, you know, trying to make things better, and then you use the safe climate tool again and see what. Well, have we improved? Has what's going on in the organisation made things better? So we've worked with um, a lot of companies um, using the safety climate tool as part of you know, improving safety culture. Um, we've also run workshops and focus groups to explore those issues as well. So, you know, what's health and safety like here? Um, you know, why are people, you know, what's risk taking like here and just using very open questions to explore um, what people have been saying and then well, okay you've, you've spent an hour moaning how would you make things better we've done some work with uh, a UK nickel refiner um, who were one of the early adopters and bought the safety climate tool in 2010 um, and they re-ran it last year in uh, spring of 2012 and they got better. So this is a, a quartile um, chart of using the safety climate tool data. <coughs> so the, uh, the bottom line, blue line, is where they were in 2010. So they, you know, they were, they were on, on the bottom quartile for accidents of near missed reporting and um, organisational commitment. And when it was run two years later, they had um, significantly improved on quite a lot of the factors. What was interesting for us was that the ones that they didn't improve much on, um, so they, they didn't make, um, they didn't move as far out of the red on accident and near misreporting, was that they had no um, control over their accident and near misreporting scheme. It had been mandated from Canada, and yes, stuck with it. And they also found that their um, work-related injuries went down 20% over that time period. And it was the first time in refinery's history that they not had a lost time injury. And we also find with um, some of the companies, um, we have case studies for these on our website, um, that that is a, a similar pattern, that people are... Um, reporting reduced instances of um, accidents and near misses. They're all reporting increased numbers of near misses, which is a, a good thing, um, and that their hours lost due to accidents have also been reduced. So the other thing we are asked about is benchmarking, because you can get you know you can get the charts from the safety climate tool, um, you know with the I don't know I'm. Three and a half out of five um, on the factor. Just what you know? What does that mean? Is that good? Is it bad? Um, how much better can we actually get? Are we good for our sector? Um, you know, it doesn't look like we're good, but maybe you know, maybe we're good for our sector. You know, how do we compare? I mean, it's it's one of the things uh, a lot of organisations engage in benchmarking with. You know, and boards like to know that you know they're, they're best in class or best in uh, best in sector. 
from my perspective, the challenge is it's catch 22. You know, like, when do I have enough data to say, you know, hand on heart that, you know, that this, this is what good looks like? Um, or, ha you know, how many companies do you need within a sector to say this is, this is sufficient? Okay, so this is the quartile charter showed earlier, which is one of the ways we present our benchmarking data. And um, this is um, three organisations within a single sector. So you can see that there's a similar pattern. And you can also see, okay, you know, if you were um, the bottom line that you can improve and that, you know, there's other people you could speak to um, or, you know, you could explore what it is that they're actually doing to improve. My challenge is, is that somebody always has to be the bottom. And when you, when you go and present to people, and it's like, okay, yes, you're, you're mainly in the bottom quartile. Yeah, it's not a good place to be. But the plus from that is that, you know, there's things you can do. And that by finding out, you've started that journey. Okay, so the challenges from our point of view with benchmarks, there's the global culture issue. So if a questionnaire has been given out in Finland um, and it's been answered, or um, we have a particular issue with Nor Nor our Norwegian surveys, it's are the Norwegians just more negative than anybody else? Or are the sites that we've worked with just poor? We have issues with company cultures. So if we get the data back from um, a large multi-site organization, is that just you know, one line uh, you know, on, the, on, the, um, on the graph? Or is it if they've got 10 sites, is it 10 lines? And again, I, yeah, I, I can't answer that. There's different regulatory regimes. Do they have an impact? You know, if you, um, you know, a, a commissioning or license regime, will, you know, will that be different? Will smaller organisations tend to be better than larger organisations just because it's easier to be controlled and you know people's names and they're more likely to be engaged? From my perspective, when will I have enough data? Now I have, I have, you know, if I include my overseas sites, I've got about 50,000 returns from um, about 100 companies. Is that enough? And my, my biggest fear about offering it is that it makes people complacent. That if you, you know, if you're the top line on one of those graphs, or if you're in the green, would you just say, okay, we're good enough? Okay, so this is uh, my final definition. The sum of stupidity of a group of people at a given time. You could flick it on its head, I guess. Okay, so that, that's, that's my journey. Thank you. <laughs>